This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to Pomacea Presbyterian Church, and thank you for being a part of the community that gathers together for worship. Whether we gather online or whether we gather physically in a sanctuary, we know we are a part of the body of Christ that on this, the Lord's Day, is gathering around the world. And whether you're here regularly or whether you're a visitor with us today, we're glad you're here. And we count your presence a part of the Spirit's gift to us. Today, we're looking at the gospel story of the ascension of Jesus and some of his last words in this life to his disciples. As the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let us be called to worship. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell what God has done for me. I cried aloud to the Lord, and God was extolled with my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. God has given heed to the words of my prayer. Blessed be God, because the Lord has not rejected my prayer or removed God's steadfast love from me. Let us pray. God, as we gather in worship this day, we give you thanks for your steadfast love and faithfulness in every time and in every place. We ask that you would be with us in this time of worship, that our worship, that our songs of praise, that our prayers, 
that our meditation on the gift of your word would be pleasing and acceptable to you. God, we ask this in the name of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Spirit, the Advocate, gives us the words we need to speak. Jesus Christ himself prays for us. We need not fear sharing our failings with the one who abides with us and in us. With the confidence of the children of God, let us confess our sin together. Lord, you tell us that if we love you, we will keep your commandments. You tell us that your new commandment is to love one another as you have loved us. We cannot possibly live up to this standard. We frequently neglect your teachings. We easily see others' faults and too often make excuses for our own. Send the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, to help us follow your instructions to feed the hungry, tend to the hurting, and love our enemies. In your mercy, forgive us yet again and free us to love God and neighbor more fully. Amen. God is not far from us. God is closer than our own breath. We are not alone, not left to save ourselves. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. When we confess our sin and repent, the heavens rejoice, and we can trust that we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. We turn now to the reading of God's word, and we proceed it with prayer. Almighty God, we know that we are not to be a people of fear, and yet there is much of which we are afraid in these challenging times. We come to you now, asking for the gift of your living word. 
Enlighten the eyes of our heart so that we can be the people of love you call us to be. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Acts, the first chapter, verses 1 to 11. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, boys and girls. It's good to be in church with you together. It makes church better for us when you're here. It really does. I took my mask off because I'm here in the sanctuary at the church and there are other people here with us. And so we're trying to care for each other and protect each other's health by wearing our masks, especially right now when the coronavirus is there. So I know you're doing the same thing in many different places. I don't always wear it, but I wear the mask when I'm in a place with other people and we want to be sure and protect each other. When I'm in my house with my wife, we don't wear the mask then because we're sharing together, living together in that house. But when I'm with somebody who I'm not with all the time, then I'm putting the mask on to help to care for them. And there are people here in the room running the camera and running the recorders and helping with the service today. And we're caring for each other's health with the mask, just as you are too. I'm wearing one too. Now in the scripture passage that Pastor Nicole read just a moment ago, it tells a story of a time when after he had come to life again, after he had died and God brought Jesus back to life in the resurrection, and Jesus had spent period of 50 days with his disciples, it then was time for him to go and be with God. And the Bible says he left them. It says that he physically went away from them. And this is called the ascension, the ascension. We say it whenever we say the Apostles' Creed, he ascended into heaven. What do you think it looked like? I don't know, because we only have the words in the Bible describing it. We don't have a picture of it. But some people have tried to draw pictures of it, and here's one I've got on my iPad I'll show you that uh, is one that I think maybe looks like what it was like. It's this picture right here. This shows Jesus with his arms outstretched, and he's coming off of the ground and he is ascending or going up to be with God. Because it says he went 
to be with God and that he went towards the clouds, I, I think he probably went up. And so I think the picture is helping us that way. What the words are telling us, the picture is showing us. But the thing we know best is that he went to be with God. You know what I think ascension is like when Jesus went to be with God? I think it's kind of like graduating. Do you know somebody who's graduating this year, who's finished with school and is leaving school to go to a new thing, a new chapter in their life? This year, because of the virus, we're not able to have all of the graduation ceremonies where you may see older brothers and sisters or cousins or neighbors finish school. They're usually wearing a black robe like this one and often a hat. It's a very happy time. And I think Jesus was happy when he ascended, when he graduated to be with God. And even though he ascended, the Bible tells us, and Jesus promised, that he is still with us. He's with us through his spirit. We may not be able to see it like we can see one another, but he is with us, loving us and helping us and protecting us. Jesus went to be with God, and one of the best things I think about that place is that it's free from any pain or suffering. Specifically, there isn't any coronavirus there, and I'm glad for that, for the way in which we know that God promises God is working and working to bring us together to that family place and the family time when there won't be any illness and where we'll all be safe and happy together. In the meantime, let's keep loving each other and doing the things that are signs of family love and neighborly love. And let's keep trying to be aware with our hearts and our minds, eyes and our ears of where we might sense Jesus still being present with us. Let's pray together. Loving God, thank you for the story of Jesus in the way in which we learn that he has gone to be with God. Thank you for the good news in that. Thank you that we also can be with God and that Jesus connects us in his love and in his care. Help us to be faithful disciples loving one another until he brings us together all in the same place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Worship always has a time for offering, and one of the things that we're able to offer up as a part of worship is the intentions that we have for the week ahead and the use of our time and our hours, and also the gifts, the, the generosity that the Spirit brings forth in us as a way of sharing with others. Thank you for the way you continue to bring in groceries into the fellowship hall at the church Sunday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., they're coming in and they are helping to feed hungry people here in Hillsborough County, both at N68 Hours of Hunger and the Bethel Mission. That need continues and your generosity is a way in which we're able to keep meeting it. And we're collecting now also for the needs at the Abe Brown Prison Ministries and also for the Angel Closet at the Faith Cafe. We're able to make gently used or new clothing available to those who come seeking a meal there. We are grateful. We're also grateful for the COVID relief fund that you have been so generous in supporting. The Witness and Service Committee met on Friday of this week and has distributed even more of the money, not only to those who are suffering most, but to several partner institutions here in the county and even several countries in the world, particularly Haiti and Uganda, where the clinics that we support are contending with it there also. The money is going to relieve suffering, 100% of it, and I thank you for that. And I also thank you for your generosity supporting the budget of the church. Your gifts enable us to keep worship coming, and it also enables us to continue the compassionate outreach. Thank God for your generosity and for offering as a part of the Christian life. 
You also have the chance to lift up your prayers, and I share with you some news of the congregation this week. We have several who are in the hospital or home recovering from surgery. Please keep in your prayers Kathleen Garrett, who's doing well recovering from surgery. We pray also for Steve Long. He has been in the hospital about six months now, came out for just a couple of days, and now has gone back into intensive care, this time at St. Joseph's Hospital. We're praying also for Nelson Gallardo, who had heart surgery on Friday of this week, and for Amy as she cares for him, and for all who love him and gather around him. We're also praying for those who are grieving. We keep in our prayers David Pede. His mother died earlier this spring, and now his sister has also died. And we support David and Patricia and all who have loved his sister. We're remembering Ben Hill III and his family in the death of his mother. She lived a long and good life. She was 101 when she died here in Tampa. And the influence of her character and her faith has been a great blessing. And we gather that family in our prayers as they give thanks for her life now. We're remembering Rick McClintock and the death of his father at the beginning of this Easter season. And we keep Rick and Maggie and all who have loved his father in our prayers. I also ask that you keep in your prayers any who are suffering, especially in the fires down near Naples. Of course, in the midst of this virus, other problems in the world go on. And we're praying for Floridians who are um, trying to stay safe in the midst of that moment. We pray, too, continually for those who are in the front line and caring for the sick and for those administering public health in the community and for all who are a part of helping the community love one another. Let us pray now that God might bless this offering. In your gospel, you tell us, O Lord, that to those to whom much is given, much is expected. So we pray now that you would help us help the sick, the grieving, the poor, the suffering. Take these, our gifts, and use them for your purposes. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, remembering how he said, what you ask in my name, I will ask the Father, and he will bring to you. Amen.
The Gospel lesson for the sixth Sunday of Easter comes once again from the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, beginning this Sunday with verse 15 and reading through verse 21. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Those who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is now um, about the fourth Sunday in which we've been reading from the Gospel of John these words from Jesus um, that the disciples remember, words that came um, before his death, but they remember them after his resurrection. And um, it comes back to them now, and that's why we have them in the season of Eastertide. Here in John's Gospel, we get the last meal, which is particularly manifested in the foot washing, and then we have the last discourse, the last sermon, if you will, of Jesus, and then the last prayer that follows that. And they remember all of that. It was profoundly important to them. And it's so substantive that we can only deal with a section of it at a time. It's as if they're remembering his last words. You know something of last words, don't you? We are often interested when we hear that someone has died in the last thing they said. I remember how often I've seen family members standing by the bedside of someone who's been struggling with death and saying to them, and sometimes encouraged by hospice care workers to say to them, it's all right, you can go on now. It's all right, we are going to be okay. Giving people permission to take that next step. Those are the last words that we speak, but we place a weighted emphasis on the last words that people speak as well. And for that reason, I think the early Christian community remembered these words of Jesus, not the words from the cross, but rather these words that he shared with them in that last supper, that last discourse, that last prayer, as especially powerful words. Now that makes me wonder what my last words might be. I'm afraid they're going to be something like, honey, did you remember to change the air conditioner filter? I mean, we do go through life with a regular degree of tasks and duties, don't we? And so I'm not suggesting that you um, should live with worry about that. Although I do think it's smart to write a letter and to leave it to those you love and your friends about what you might want to be remembered as having said as they go through the experience of the end of our lives. If you want them to know what you valued and what it is that you would communicate to them, that's a prudent thing to write a letter and to leave it for uh, keeping either in your own file. The church has a file where we're happy to keep last letters like that from people that they would like for us to share with their families later. The community of faith remembers these words from Jesus, and he speaks to reassure us. So he says those powerfully reassuring words, I will not leave you orphaned. Or some translations say, I will not leave you comfortless. I will not abandon you. And that is a, such a basic fear, isn't it, amongst people, that someone might leave us? It's a childlike sense to it, but that's because I think it's so primal. And that's what they were afraid of at that moment, that Jesus might abandon them, but he assures them 
that he will not, that he will come to them and that he will be present with them, present with us, both in his presence in coming again and in his presence in the spirit, the advocate. Now in the children's sermon, if you listened, I shared with the children that Jesus ascended to be with God and that begs the question, how can he have ascended and be present? Well, I think in the ascension, Jesus moved from being in one place and time to being in all places and all time. That's the power of the ascension in my understanding of it. But I do think it's possible for people to be geographically someplace else and yet to be very present with us in intentionality, in comfort, in relationship. And relationship is at the heart of these remembered words much more so than geography, I think. Sometimes the flip negative illustrates this better, how we can not be present with someone even when our body is next to them. Just think of the last time you were at the ATM machine in a line and that there was someone in front of you and they were taking their turn. How aware of them were you? Or were you like me while you were physically standing in line with them in your head, your thoughts were someplace else altogether. This last week, my thoughts while I stood in that line were with my brother in Orlando. I think it's true, and this passage speaks about being present in truth. I think it's true that I was more present with my brother in Orlando than I was with the person I was physically behind in line there. Think about that. We have more experience with that than we realize. My wife, Emily, will say to me, and probably embarrassingly often as we're in the house together, John, where are you? And she doesn't mean physically, where are you? Because she can see me, I'm sitting right there. But she means mentally, in my presence, I'm off someplace else. And often I'm here, <laughs> down here at the church, thinking about what we're doing and what we should be doing next. And sometimes I may be someplace more mundane. <laughs> But it's a way of calling me to the reality of trying to be present with those I love. Present not just physically, but present also in heart, in care, in mind, in person. There is comfort in physical presence. And I think Jesus, knowing that, reassures us and says, I will not abandon you. And how often that presence has been mediated to us through physical things that are not that person's physical persona, but rather an expression of their physical care. Like a face mask, which I think we wear these days as a sign of care, as a sign of love for ourselves and for others. But I also have up here this hand cross. We started probably about five years ago, giving out these hand crosses at the church to people who are in the hospital as they were preparing for a procedure or for surgery or just struggling with illness. I, I really had questioned about the effectiveness of them at first, but now the reports I've gotten from people make it clear how effective they are, a tool communicating the care that others bring. I remember how often members of the congregation have told me that their family members have died, have chosen to die, holding on to the cross physical expression not only of the church's community with them, but the presence of Christ with them. How often Christ's presence has been mediated to me through the touch, through the words, through the action of another. If you think about it and spend some time thinking about it, you'll be pushed in terms of the reflection on presence and time and place. The boundaries are more porous than what at first it may seem. St. Jerome was a fourth century biblical scholar. His writings have shaped a great deal of the church's knowledge over time. We owe him a great deal of debt. In a very, very, very old age, he reports that when the apostle John was in Ephesus, that he grew to an extreme old age and could only move with some difficulty. And he had to be carried to the church in the arms of his disciples. 
and he was unable to give utterance to many words. I'm quoting from Jerome's writings here. He was unable to give utterance to many words, and he used to say no more at their several meetings than this. Little children love one another. At length, the other disciples and the apostles who were there, wearied with always hearing the same words, said, Master, why dost thou always say this? Little children love one another. And John replied, it's the Lord's command. And if this be done, it is enough. I wonder if those were his last words. They are the last words that the community remembers. We are called to love one another. So Jesus says at the beginning of this passage, if you love me, keep my commandments. And we remember from John that Jesus' commandment was that we love one another. Now don't substitute for loving one another being nice. We're trying to be nice. Love is a riskier business. Love involves often more work than being nice does. Being nice very often means telling people what we think they want to hear or what they can stand to hear. But love, and especially as Jesus talks about it here in these words, love means telling the truth. Love means action, even suffering action or sacrificial action, service, on the part of those who practice that love, giving when there is no reward. Love means being faithful to God, God's will and God's way, as nearly as we can know it. Love one another as I have loved you is not a sweet, sentimental nothing, but a very demanding ethic. Here's some more signs of love that I found at the church this week, signs that mediate someone's presence even when they're physically absent. This is a razor. It's left with some other razors on the fellowship hall table for people who are in the halfway houses operated, operated in this time by Abe Brown's prison ministries. It looks like an inexpensive um, disposable razor, doesn't it? But if you're not able to get this for yourself and someone else that you've never met and that you don't know provides it simply as an act of giving, it's a sign of love and care for your dignity, for your person. This is a bottle of hand sanitizer. You probably have one in your home like it. They're very important to us now. Only this one is going to the A. Brown Prison Ministries because somebody came and left it here at the church because they wanted to send this sign that they care about the health and the hygiene of others who don't have the capacity to provide much of this for themselves. I think it makes them tangibly present. It's a jar of peanut butter. It's a pretty ordinary thing, and yet it provides nutrition to children and to farm workers and the groceries we're sending out. I've gotten to where I can hardly stand to hear my own grandchildren say at times, Papa, I'm hungry, and they're fed well. But when I hear them say it, I hear resonating the voices of the other children in our own community that I've come to learn are authentically hungry. And when we send groceries like this, nutrition, like just a jar of peanut butter, we're sending love because I know that Jesus loves those children too and cannot bear to hear them say, I'm hungry. You can be present even when you're physically absent. This is a mat, and Janet Foster in our congregation made this, and you've seen them before, likely, but they've moved me every time. She brought about 10 of them in this week, and the Kindness Matters ministry distributes these by taking them along Bayshore to the homeless people who are having to sleep out there often, and it provides them something to lie on besides the concrete. It's made out of the plastic garbage bags that so often we try to recycle or throw away that we get our own groceries in. It takes a while to make a mat like this. It's loving, being present, even when you're absent from it. And this one is beautiful. 
This is a prayer shawl that Janet made and brought to the church this week, like so many others that have been knit by women in this congregation. They tell me it takes about 20 hours to make a prayer shawl like this. Would you give away something that you spent 20 hours making? Give away to someone that you have never met and that you might not know? Give it away so that they might feel the presence of the love of others? I tell you, when they put on the shawl, they report to the pastors that they feel the love of Christ around them. That's what they tell us in their own witness. Well, it's just to say there are many ways to be present even when physically you could not be there. And they aren't all necessarily tangible things. Some of them are acts of service, like the hard work that people do in protecting the community, the hard work people do in bringing food and groceries to homes and delivering them as a part of their own vocation, the hard work that people do caring for the lives and the minds of children in our community, all of the work that people are doing can be an expression of the love that they're trying to share as a part of their fulfilling Jesus' command that you love one another. This is my commandment. Jesus said, if you love me, then you will keep my commandment. And I think one of the things that helps us do is to know each other. That when we seek to keep Jesus' commandment, and to love one another, then that begins to require that we know each other, which probably is why historically the church has valued fellowship so much. You know, church night suppers and coffee in the fellowship hall and small group study and standing in the courtyard and talking and visiting. Part of the reason that we feel the deprivation of those things so much right now, that they're not here with us, is because in ways we don't realize, they are such a means of grace in helping us to know one another. So we have to be creative about that. We have to let love work to help us find more creative, active, serving ways to know each other, that we might love each other, and even come to love those that we still need to come to know. And all of this, keeping His commandment, loving one another, knowing each other, through that experiencing Him present with us, I think that's a part of how we are practicing for the life to come, for the life with Christ, for the life that we're going home to. I read this week someone who said, every night that I go to sleep, I find myself thinking about this gospel and how it's asking the question at the end of the day, in what way did I fail to love today? That's a question and there's a word of judgment in it, and I suppose that there's a place for that question at times. But I also encourage you to ask it at the end of the day, in what way, Spirit, show me in what way I was able to love today, because even we ourselves are not always aware of it. And ask it in the morning too. Ask it before your feet hit the ground, as you wake up. Spirit, presence of Christ, show me in what way today I can love you. I like the way this prayer says it. As I cannot in my own strength, nor even with the hope of success, completely love or purely love, I look to Thee, O Lord God, my Father, in Jesus, and ask for the gift of the Spirit to help me be faithful in the habits of work and prayer and care that the Spirit will prompt me to do, that I might be a witness to Your presence in loving one another. Look. We don't know exactly what's going to happen in the near future in our lives. It's a time of great uncertainty. But our call is the same as it's been across the centuries. Jesus said, keep my commandments. Jesus said, love one another. I am present with you. And I will come again and receive you unto myself. Jesus said, I will not abandon you because I live 
you will live also. And Jesus can be trusted. Let us join our hearts and our minds in prayer. Helper, Holy Spirit, Advocate, Comforter, come to us now as we seek the wisdom and will of our God. We want to love as Jesus commands, loving others no less than he loves us. And yet we struggle with pettiness and partisanship, with greed and selfishness. Our fears prevent us from practicing the perfect love that sets us free to live with joy. For just a moment, come to us and quiet our minds, calm our hearts, envelop us with the peace of Christ. Abiding in the God who abides in us, we remember Jesus' teachings to serve and tend, feed and visit, clothe and welcome. We remember those who feel forgotten. We embrace those who know rejection. We treat with tenderness those who have been abused. We seek out those who are lost. We stand with the vulnerable and speak up to those who oppress the weak. We will not abandon those who mourn, but will remain with the brokenhearted until resurrection resounds through all creation. Helper, Holy Spirit, Advocate and Comforter, come to us now to show us how to follow Christ more closely. As the world reels from this pandemic and our anxieties increase, give us the courage to speak the truth to power, the wisdom to tell the truth in love, the faith to live the truth that sets us all free. May our presence provide the light of Christ that will show us the way. Resting in that promise that we will not be left alone, 
We dare to risk our own safety and security for the sake of others. In this season, when so many are suffering, we will not forget that whenever we care for the least of these among us, we care for Christ himself. Grant us the energy to remain steadfast in our caring, the hope to bear witness to the compassion of Christ in painful places, and the inspiration to see divine possibility where others only see intractable problems. O oh, come to us now to ease our burdens, refresh our souls, and make our joy complete. Come to us now to assure us that we are not alone, not now, not ever. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now with the church around the world, let us confess and profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now the service is coming to an end, and it's time for us to go together back out into the world. For many of you, that means staying safe still in the shelter of home. 
For some of you, it means returning to essential tasks and beginning to be in businesses and the business of caring for one another in the community. We ask God's blessing on you as you go into the mission field, the week ahead, the world around us. And hear these words from 1 Peter chapter 3. The epistle reading for this Sunday is a part of the charge and benediction. In your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who asks of you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. And may the God of peace sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and will do this. And now, may the love of God the Father Almighty and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit guide and be with us all. Amen.